Crafting and Crime Daily, the show where I recap live trials so you don't have to sit and watch it all day long. Some of the stuff is really boring. Anyway, I'm just going to bring you the interesting stuff. My name is Rebecca. I'm your host, also known as Crafting Journey. I am, today I'm crafting a diamond painting. I finished that one last week after working on it for two months. I'm working on a mystery one. Now look at those colors. I have no idea what this is, none. This was sent to me by um, another YouTuber, Mickey Sunshine Creates, and uh, I sent her one. So she's trying to figure out what hers is. I'm trying to figure out what mine is. It's kind of fun. It's beautiful colors though, oh my gosh. Yes. So how was your Monday? Mine was pretty good. Today is National Cereal Day. So I started out my day with a bowl of cereal. Reese's Puffs, I think they're called. It's a variation of Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, which I absolutely love. So um, yum. 2% <laughs> milk. So that's what I had for breakfast. Tell me in your in the comments, what is your favorite cereal? Or if you don't eat cereal at all, then don't leave a comment. You don't have to say, hey, I don't like cereal. But, you know, okay. <laughs> I love it. Nothing better, especially late at night. Oh, yeah, sit there with a bowl of cereal. It's the best. Okay, today we're going to talk about a case that is going on in Florida, Hillsborough County. So, um... <laughs> Yeah, we spend a lot of time in Florida. One of the reasons we spend a lot of time in Florida is that Dan Abrams, the founder of Long Crime Network, uh, started out his network in Florida. So a lot of the trials were from Florida. And we so we go back there quite often. Now, now he's sort of national. He's nationwide. But this case is said to be, uh, at the time, right before... It happened in 2010, 2010, yeah. It didn't go to trial until 2020. At that time, it was the longest running murder trial to date, to that, to that date, that didn't get to trial. It took 10 years for this thing to get to, tr to, get to trial. Like what? So a lot of the reason is because they were arguing over the death penalty. So let me just give you a little history of uh, Florida. Uh, there, originally in Florida, it did not have to be unanimous for a jury to decide on the death penalty. And then there, the Supreme Court, the Florida Supreme Court, uh, said that that was unconstitutional. And then, uh, then they made it, they changed the law and they said, it's got to be unanimous. So at the time that this case was charged initially the state attorney said he was going to go for the death penalty then all this law happened and and it, it changed and it made it much more difficult for attorneys to get the death penalty there had to be a separate phase and then the jury would hear the case all over again and then they would have to decide uh, unanimously for the death penalty so the state attorney decided okay i'm going to take this off the table that was in early 2019 for a 2010 case. <coughs> Sorry. Excuse me. So, took, took it off the table. So, if this gentleman, Michael Keatley, is convicted, he will get life in prison without the possibility of parole. So, this case went to trial for the first time in 2020, after it occurred in 2010. And this man sitting in prison like over 3,000 days before it gets to trial. So it goes to trial. The jury votes 10 to 2, 12 person jury. 10 of the jurors thought not guilty. And they were adamant not guilty. They deliberated for seven hours and, uh, Two of the jurors were holding out. They're like, nope, we think he's guilty. And so that was a Friday afternoon. They go to the judge and they say, you know, can we think about this over the weekend? And we just wanna we just wanna sit on it and ponder it. So the judge says, okay. So they come back on Monday morning, they deliberate for about an hour, and they say, We can't 
we're, we're hung. We can't make a decision. So the judge gives them what they call an Allen charge, which is like, go back in there, give it the old college try. Let everybody, you know, everybody gather around. The first, you know, let everybody speak and give their opinion. And if you still can't reach it, well, anyway, they still couldn't reach a, a verdict. And so uh, 10 people wanted this guy acquitted. So hung jury, which means it's a declared a mistrial. And everybody's got to come back and do it again. This is what I was afraid of with the Murdoch case, that it was going to be a hung jury. And we would have to do that circus all over again. So meanwhile, this guy sits in jail for three more years. So yesterday, the trial finally started. Now, what happens in the meantime? Well, this guy's long-term attorney uh, decides I mean, he was going to run for judge. He becomes a circuit court judge in Hillsborough County. So now he's got to get another lawyer. The, the, the second lawyer that he has, he, he dies. So now he's got to get a different team. So now the defense team that he has, they're, they're up there yesterday. I'm like, oh, why do they look so familiar? I, you know, I know this team. Well, it's the defense team that defended and I don't remember the guy's name. It was the popcorn case, the the retired sheriff or police officer who was in the movie theater and he shot the guy for being too loud on his cell phone. And he was, and the popcorn went flying and he was acquitted. <coughs> I don't know what's wrong with my voice today. Anyway, that was also in Hillsborough County and had the same defense team, good group of lawyers. But then I said, I know this judge too. Is this the popcorn judge? It was not the popcorn judge. Here's where I know him from. He's done two other recent cases for law and crime. The most recent was for a, a guy named Lorenzo who was asking for the death penalty. This was... This went on during the Murdaugh trial, so a lot of people weren't paying too much attention to it, but it was the same judge. Um, and the judge says, I'm not going to give you the death penalty. And then they go they go through the whole trial, and he ends up giving him the death penalty. Um, that was this judge. And the other case that I know him from is the Matthew Terry case that I did probably the end of last year. This Matthew Terry, I don't know if you remember, he's the guy that chased his wife across the lawn and then stabbed her to death. This judge is the judge that allowed his prior girlfriend's testimony to come in. They, he allowed the jury to hear all about how this guy was tried and convicted of doing the same thing to his prior girlfriend. Now, if that doesn't ring any bells, anyway, it was a really interesting case. So, um, good looking guy. Anyway, he got, he got life in prison. I don't think they went for the death penalty in that one either. No. Nope. So, in any case, let me tell you about this case. Let's get comfortable. <laughs> Okay, Matt, Michael Keatley, uh, right now he's 52 years old. I think he was 38 or 39 at the time this began. And the whole thing began in January of 2010. On January 3rd of 2010, well, let me, let me give you a little background on Matthew Keatley, Michael, Michael Keatley. So let me tell you about the, the case Let's talk about Michael Keatley. Um, he's 52 years old at the time that this all went down in 2010. I think he was 38, 39 years old. He grew up in Hillsborough County. Now, if you're not familiar with Florida, and a lot of you aren't, Hillsborough County is where Tampa is, St. Petersburg, and then there's all kinds of little towns just surrounding it that make up Hillsborough County. This is a little town south of Tampa called Ruskin. Um, a lot of uh, migrant workers, it's a lower socioeconomic area, a lot of Latin people, and Michael Keatley grew up there. He, uh, he, his career was, he worked on airplanes. He started working on small planes and then 
worked his way up into jets. Um, he actually got a job with an airline up in Atlanta working on jets. And in around 2005, 2006, he was laid off. So 2005, 2000, not a good time. <laughs> uh, not was not a good year, I can just tell you that. Anyway, so uh, they he goes back home to Ruskin. Um, where his parents are still residing. I don't think he went moved home with his parents, but he goes comes back to the area, and he decides I'm gonna I'm gonna do this ice cream truck thing. So he gets a purple van, and I'll show you a couple pictures of the van here. And he turns it into an ice cream truck, and he drives around this South Hillsborough County area. Um, <laughs> Several times this winter, I heard the ice cream man outside, and it, they always play La Cucaracha. La Cucaracha, La Cucaracha. And I was, I'm always singing with the ice cream man. <laughs> anyway, I don't know what, what he was playing on his, you know, ding, da, da, ding, 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 ice cream thing. But uh, I need to be diamond pink because I'm goofing. Um, so anyway, <laughs> he's driving home one evening you know, he would, like, a lot of his, his customers were these migrant workers' children, and he would sell his ice cream for less than a buck, sometimes freeze. He'd let them run tabs. You know, he was, he was just having a good time with it. So he's driving home one night, and he stops to gas up the van. Uh, he puts gas in it, and then he starts to head home to get ready for a date. So he sees a woman and she's flagging him down and he's, he's like, oh, maybe she wants some ice cream. So he stops the van and two black men and the black woman get into the van and they rob him. And they also shoot him four times. He was shot in the leg. He was shot in the arm the left arm, who was shot in the chest and the right knuckles, not right knuckles and wrist. He uh, ends up hospitalized. He's had, he has to have multiple surgeries. He had, uh, fra his fingers were fractured. His humerus was fractured. Uh, he had bone grafts to his left hand. Um, he had bullet removed from his back. I guess it, it went into his chest and lodged in his back. Ooh. So, so it, this left him with a limp, a profound, a profound limp, according to the defense team. And uh, he had a difficulty grasping or gripping objects, which is very important to this case. Uh, so after he gets out of the hospital, he has to go live at his parents' house. His parents set up a hospital bed for him in their dining room. They have to help him clean himself. They have to help him eat. Like, he is just really debilitated, injured horribly. So he gets really, really frustrated after waiting months and months. He's trying to rehabilitate. He's going to therapy. And the Hillsborough County Sheriffs are just, they have nothing. They can't figure out what's happening with this guy. Uh, with this robbery, and get, oh my god, this is the worst part, they only got 12 bucks, this whole thing was over 12 dollars, yeah, 12 dollars, two, and the two black men, he describes as uh, black males, they're both armed, and they were both wearing masks, the woman, he said, was a black woman, and he described the clothing that she was wearing as well, but no leads by the sheriff. So he decides, I'm going to investigate this thing myself. So he goes around the neighborhood and he's knocking on doors and he's talking to people. And he, he, um, based on all the information he gets, he decides that he's looking for a guy named Creep or Creeper that is somehow involved with the robbery. So Fast forward to Thanksgiving Day of the same year, 11 months later, November 25th, the morning of November 25th on Ocean Mist Drive, 
a group of men, they get together, Latin men, they get together and they're drinking and it's two o'clock in the morning. They're, they're in front of their house, they're drinking, they're playing cards, they're doing a little cocaine. And all of a sudden, this van pulls up, a dark van pulls up. This guy gets out, he's got a t-shirt on that has a sheriff emblem on it. They think he's law enforcement. He says, where's Creeper or where's Creep? Now they know who Creeper is. He actually lives a few doors down, like down the street on Ocean Mist. <laughs> but they don't say anything. So he's like down on the ground, give me your IDs. So they're thinking it's law enforcement. So they get down on the ground. He starts shooting them. Now this happens very quickly. So one by one by one, he shoots these guys. Two of them die, four of them are injured, one gets away. So the victims were Juan and Sergio Guitron, uh, brothers. Then there were four survivors, Richard Cantu, Ramon uh, Galan, Gonzalo Ruiz, Ruiz, and Daniel Bertrand. I may be butchering their names. I, I, I don't speak Latin, I'm sorry. And I do apologize. But, um, so they, they survived. Now the one guy who, uh, he was in a coma. He, they wait till he wakes up from the coma and they show him a lineup. And uh, well, even before this, you know, the people that, victims that survived and other witnesses all described the guy to the police. They described the van, a dark van, and it was very, very dark that night. No street lights, just whatever light was in front of this, like basically a trailer uh, that they were um, playing cards in front of. So really, really dark. So it would have been very, very difficult to see this guy and describe him with any accuracy. And some of them said, we got a good look at him. None of them said, hey, it's the ice cream man that we see all the time. So, but they said that the guy had a pump action shotgun. Okay. Now, how is Michael Keatley, with his inability to grip anything, wielding a pump action shotgun? Um, I don't know. Anyway. So, meanwhile, there's a, uh, this guy, this, go back to this guy. He's, he's in a coma. He comes out of his coma. The police show him a photo lineup. He picks out Michael Keatley, starts crying, and says, I am 2,000% sure that that is the guy. So they arrest Michael Keatley. Now there's several wit people that come forward that know Michael Keatley that are going to, or have testified in the prior trial that may testify in this trial about um, conversations that they had with Keatley where he said he was, you know, he wanted to find this creeper and shoot him and that, I don't know. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But so the prosecution's cl opening argument was that this case is all about revenge. That Michael Keatley was dead set on getting revenge for being shot four times, robbed of $12, uh, and injured so severely. I can't blame him for that, but you know, I don't know about revenge. Now the defense's theory of the case is, it wasn't him. This is a case of mistaken identity. Now prosecution says it was a mistake, mistaken address because he probably meant to go two doors down to the creeper house, but he ended up at this house where these group of guys were. Now, I don't know if he just thought, well, you know, this guy's among them. So prosecute, the defense is like, no, this was a wrong guy. Wrong guy, you got the wrong guy. Mm -mm. So we're gonna hear all about uh, forensic evidence, uh, shell casings that match other shell casings and a notebook that was found in Michael Keatley's residence that has the word creeper written into it and the ocean is addressed. Okay, we're going, they're gonna talk about, we're gonna hear evidence about computer searches that Michael Keatley did. Okay, so that is the case.
so far. Now, they did put on a few witnesses yesterday, and I'm going to listen to those, and I'm going to summate all of what happened yesterday after the openings and everything that happens today, and we'll bring it to you tomorrow. Yes, but really, really interesting trial. Uh, you know, was it him? You know, he wasn't... Neither side were, were able to convince a jury last time one way or the other. I don't know if they're going to be able to do it this time. But I like this judge. I do like this judge. You know, in that Matthew Terry case, that that's a huge appellate issue that he, the fact that he let that woman testify about that prior crime and it came in and, he, and this guy gets convicted. So, you know. Uh, so this is an interesting case, None, nonetheless. So that is the show for the day, guys. I hope you enjoy the content. Please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. If you are a subscriber, consider becoming a member or just do a super thanks. Down there next to the thumbs up button, just follow that across the screen. There's a thanks button where you can make a one-time donation that goes to help to support content on the channel. Anyway, that's my spiel. Guys, have a great Tuesday. I will see you tomorrow in Corrupting and Crime Daily. Take care. Bye.